Hi, my name is Andy Rice from SailJuice.com, and joining me from Weymouth this morning is Lily Zhu and John Emmett, who between them, they are the dream team that won the radial gold medal at London 2012. Well, actually, only one of you was in the boat, but you <laughs> deserve a little bit of credit for that as well, John. So thanks for joining me both this morning. How are you doing? Uh, hello, Andy. And uh, yeah, since after the coronavirus situation, we sort of locked down ourselves in Weymouth. And originally, uh, I do a bit of media work at home, and then I would like to go out, especially to go to the gym. But since everything's shut, so I need to adapt a new lifestyle and just probably uh, go a bit more running and cycling. So Weymouth is a good place to cycle about. It's a nice place, it, a, a, <laughs> still allowed to go out. And, and yesterday you both, both went for a bike ride, I understand, but one of you went for a little bit longer than the other. Tell me about that, John. Well, I've got to be honest, uh, I've, I've quite enjoyed the lockdown. It might actually finally start to lose a bit of my, my beer belly. Um, I mean, the cycling round here is wonderful. I've been good boy, I only go once, once a day, but yeah, there's nobody any- Six hours or something, right? Well, <laughs> not at the moment. My bum's a bit sore, but it's it's so nice. I mean, uh, any other cyclists are so much faster than me. Social distancing isn't isn't much of a problem at the moment. Um, the embarrassing thing is, I bought a new bike uh, shortly after the Rio Games, and I had never used it. And uh, I didn't even know this, but it's got um, uh, gears that are uh, DI two gears, and you need a battery to change it. And I didn't know that, and the battery went flat. So the first cycle I did, Ooh. I couldn't change gear. I'm like, what's what's wrong with me? So I ended up cycling around and around and around a drive through uh, Starbucks in Weymouth, and then one member of staff who was inside, I don't know what they thought I was doing. And eventually, I had to um, go home and and phone a friend. But yeah, I think. Uh, well, it's probably done my beer belly an awful lot of good to, to well, go out cycling. Well, I mean, if there's a, ever a place that needs gears on a bike, it's Weymouth. <laughs> I mean, you've got some monumental hills along the Jurassic coastline. But anyway, I'm just scared of the down. I'm just scared of the downhill, to be honest. Well, yeah, <laughs> so you should be. So you should be. But um, I, I want to ask you um, a really, really broad question, and I don't know where it's going to take us. But I'm going to ask you. Lily, how do you win an Olympic medal? You've won two of them, a bronze and a gold. If you ask me the biggest key point, I would say uh, mental toughness, because uh, since 2008, games in Beijing, uh, the sailing event is, was in Qingdao, I had the first taste of what pressure really is. <laughs> and then I could feel how much it could uh, affect our performance. And then things after that, apart from paying attention on improving my fitness as well as my technique uh, in sailing, I also spent more time in reading books about uh, mental uh, psychology, sports psychology, and uh, apply to my everyday training as well as uh, event pre preparation. So leading into the final medal race in London, where uh, the four sailors from four countries are equal, were equal, uh, it all depends on how well we can perform under great, great pressure. So at that moment I feel psychology really helps me and uh, I can still uh, perform my real ability even my heart's beating very hard. So um, th that psychology you obviously got the psychology right because that four-way battle for gold you did indeed win it. The sailor that you were in Beijing 2008 would you have been able to win the gold medal with the psychological skills that you had in 2008? Or did you learn extra skills in those following four years that made you much stronger for London 2012? I think I've learned a lot more and uh, be more an all-round sailor for London 2012 games. And in, uh, in 2008, uh, if, for example, that strong wind day, we had three races as planned, probably I will have the chance to win a gold medal. But unfortunately, uh, the ankle couldn't work properly. Anchor. And then we, yeah, the anchor. <laughs> and then we ended up with only one race. Um, but 
Personally, I was quite struggling with the light wind, strong current and big wave condition in Qingdao. I'm not very good in that. Right. Well, you weren't very good then, but I'm, I'm sure you would, have, uh, you would have got better at that. John, when you first started working with Lily, uh, firstly, what year was that? Um, and what were your observations about her strengths and weaknesses? Wow, I think you're going to get a very long answer, but I'll, I'll do my you're best. You're good at that, John. The, I, I might the, have first, the first thing I, I have to completely agree with Lily about the, the psychological aspect. I've been working for Finland uh, and we've been doing a trial system and we just finished the Worlds, which was the final trials. And, and the two sailors in the Worlds, neither sailed as, as well as they possibly could. It does, it does really... Um, make a huge difference to your performance and what I said to, to Lily I'm actually sat uh, in my front lounge and I remember the conversation with Lily from my from my bedroom the day of the medal race as if it was yesterday um, I talked about her being an actress and giving a performance so that takes the pressure off yourself you're just doing something that you that you've rehearsed and it takes that emotional part away you're just an actress giving a performance because everyone says the, the, the standard question is, how do you win an Olympic gold medal? But the fact is often you don't, you just make sure you don't lose it. Um, and you don't think about the end goal. Everything is, I'm not fit enough, I need to get fitter. I'm not good enough in light winds, I need to practice that more. That's, uh, that's what it's all about. And you, you actually, you don't want to think about that Olympic gold medal down your around your neck because that's just that's just more more pressure for you john that's a really interesting point about uh think of yourself as an actress lily how useful did you find that piece of advice and how much <laughs> did you take that into your performance do i have to stop listening now <laughs> no i thought i did use that so i did lots of rehearsals throughout the campaign leading to 2012 and then um, I think before the medal race, I just meditate over and over again. I'm an elegant actress. And because uh, very different compared with other events, because suddenly we have lots of camera uh, shooting us and then lots of journalists appeared on that medal race day. So I really pretend myself as an elegant actress and I'm very used to all of this because I just meditate over and over again. Uh, as I mentioned in my book as well, that maybe physically you can only go to the games a few times throughout your life, but mentally you can go through it hundreds and thousands of times. And by the time you're actually at the games, I will feel at ease because I just meditated, uh, experiencing this many, many times. I'm very used to it. So that's, yeah, I did as John uh, suggested. So uh, looking at so many cameras, I feel, wow, well, just like I'm walking on the red carpet or something, still at ease. I mean, for me, the second, uh, the answer to the second part of your question, the thing that most attracted me to working with Lily was her constant drive to improve. So it's funny, you have uh, different categories of people and you get some people who just want to be left alone. You get some people who just want to be told they've done well. And then the people who want to be told what they've done wrong and how they can improve, they're the ones you can really help. Uh, and sometimes people don't actually realize what category uh, they're in. And I think for Lily, she really wanted to improve. So everything else, you know, whether we need to look at improving leg strength or improve starting, that's that's just detail. Uh, the big picture was that she she really wanted to improve, and the thing with the medal race that relaxed me. Um, I listened to the pre-race interviews, and it was a little bit funny for me because Lily said in her interview almost word for word what I said to her on our final briefing, and actually it was the same with Evie and Marit, especially with Marit. I could really hear Mark Littlejohn's words <laughs> and, and Evie. And then I saw that Annalise didn't do the interview. And um, I, that's, that's when I felt a bit more confident for, for Lily because Annalise is a fantastic sailor. She was easily the fastest upwind in that wind range. In fact, if the races had been the other way around and the women had started 
don't listen really. If the women had started when the men started, when it was a bit windier, you know, I think Annalise probably would have been walking away with a medal. And she's just jumped uh, back into the radial class and at the Worlds, straight to the front of the fleet. Not only fast, but really smart. But yeah, that interview, uh, before the race even started, that, that told me a huge amount. But Annalise not doing an interview, why did that give you confidence? I, I was just reading the, the sailor's uh, mental state at that, at that time. You know, Lily's approach was exactly what we talked about. She said, I mean, it's obviously Lily's own words that, you know, she wanted to, to do it all for, for joy. Um, I, I said, you know, go out, work hard, have fun. Anyone I've ever coached, I, <laughs> I say that a lot uh, because it's important. You've got to enjoy the, the journey. And I still have the, the email I sent to her on the final day. I think you'll probably be surprised just how short and concise the information is when we get to that stage because we've done all the hard work. John, uh, you've obviously been very complimentary about everything that Lily um, could do, and you've highlighted perhaps one of the most important things, Lily's uh, drive to always improve on any weakness. What, for you, were the biggest technical weaknesses that you needed to address when you started working with Lily? I felt, I felt a little bit sad that she hadn't had a, a lot more time with, uh, with a sort of specific laser coach before, because as an incredibly talented sailor, I, I couldn't believe what people had never told her. So one of the big examples when sailing against her in uh, Dongshang, she came into the uh, Wimber Mark on port uh, to do a tack and bear away. And she didn't let her kick her off before doing the tack. And I'm sailing. I nearly ended up in the boat with her because she couldn't, uh, couldn't bear away because the kicker was still hard on. And all these little things, it's like, no, nobody, nobody ever told you that? All oh, right, okay. Um, so yeah, I felt a bit sad. I mean, you asked a very broad question earlier because I, I sort of started working with Lily in 2010. I met her up in Largs. Uh, she obviously had severe back problems. I explained to her what I was going to help her with the, with the Pilates. And then the next thing I know, I've got an email, the leaders have taken me back to China. So I spent a month twiddling my thumbs in Weymouth and I still don't quite know why I ever worked for China again because if anyone did that to me now, you know, I, I wouldn't work for them again. So in 2011, I thought, you know, not, not going to be tricked or, or whatever this time. I did half, half the work with Swiss, which I worked for for 2008. And then I did the Olympic test for China. Um, so if China were pulled out of that, then I would still have been uh, working because I, I'm so lucky, Andy. I love being on the water every day. And it was a bit torture not to be able to go out in 2011 because my sailor was... Uh, I don't know, 10,000 kilometres away. Yeah. Uh, Lily, you've been able to observe uh, two different uh, cultures, different sides of the world, and how they go about preparing for an Olympic Games. Uh, what do you think are the, the, the good sides of working in China and the Chinese approach, and what are the good sides of the British approach? Mm -hmm. I could see uh, how different those two countries <laughs> or, or the training or development systems are. For example, the good thing about China is um, financially we don't have any pressure and the parent, our parents don't need to pay anything, <laughs> whereas in the UK, unless you are becoming a top three or world class sailor, and uh, by that time you will be covered by RYA but before that it's all your parents hard work and time but in China once we were selected and then um, we sort of sell ourselves to the country we don't need to pay anything but we have to obey all the uh, instructions and uh, all the plans that they uh, the coaches or leaders uh, have planned for us we don't have much freedom so one example is we can go back home once a year for about one or two weeks so that's I, I guess it's un, un, unimaginable for Westerners whereas I see wow <laughs> I'm really envy Western sailors because you almost go back every time after an important event <laughs> or you, 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 your, your training camp is always like uh, two or three weeks whereas once we go out for winter training it's six months 
in the same location training every day just rest um one day a week for some days we are off but the rest of the week we just train in twice or three times a day um obviously we have more time to practice but the price we pay is one we don't have that much time to study properly and then we don't have any social life it's just like an okay. army life um but uh I would say for British sailors, you spend more time in learning theories behind it first. So you would teach the kids or beginners what's the theory behind it. And I can see you, you like for example, weekend trips, uh, weekend training camps uh, throughout the winter. I've been involved in uh, some of the training camps. I can see, um, for example, during the weekend, you may end up sailing one day because of the weather. Uh, but every evening or, or during the day when you can't sail, you spend a lot of time in learning those theories. And then you compare with this, you lack the time of practice. So if these two can combine a little bit, I think it will work better. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot for us Chinese we can learn from the British system. John, what do it's you funny. think about that? Learning by I, doing, learning by doing as opposed to learning by theory and, and classroom. What do you think? I, I was just going to ask Lily, I, I wonder what she thinks from the parents' point of view, because I think the phrase is you, you think it's quite good for the parents because they don't have to, to, to pay any money or any financial responsibility. But my understanding is a lot of British parents love taking their kids away every weekend. At least I think they do. Well, go on, Lily. What, what, what do you think? You think the parents, it's a relief uh, or the financial side or? I think for the Chinese parents, they, apart from, um, they feel a bit homesick because they can't see their daughters or sons, their children uh, as normal or as other ordinary families. But on the other hand, they, they feel quite happy. They don't need to pay that much. That's what I money. thought. <laughs> like for, for our living standard, it's impossible to afford all those expenses to support of kids growing up doing lots of sailing camps, training and racing. It's impossible for our uh, salary level. But um, yeah, it's, it's two-sided. No, I mean, yeah. I think in answer to your question, Andy, I think balance is very important. And uh, one of the things that probably helped Lily uh, was that she broke a bone in her hand in Miami. So she had a little bit of time off from sailing. And what I think that this? So after Lily won the Miami World Cup, we went for a bit of a cycle and um, I'm cycling along. January 2012. Okay. And I'm cycling along and I hear a, a scream and a crunch and you, you know that's not going to be a good thing. <laughs> but I think in hindsight, the Chinese would probably never have given Lily that time off that she needed. So one, uh, mentally, she did a fantastic job preparing. I remember talking to her at the, at the back of an aeroplane flying home and we, we found the silver lining and she did a lot of uh, core work, and a lot of leg strength work, so that actually she won Air, which was a, a really strong wing regatta. I was a bit frustrated with the media, not, not pointing at you, Andy, because uh, they put a, a picture of her everywhere saying something like, Lily struggles, wins, but struggles in strong winds, and a picture of Lily capsized after attack. And what they, they didn't mention is Lily capsized in the tap, then she got the boat back up right, and then she overtook Marriott again, up wind. But then I, I spent like another three years trying to get Lily to do big roll tacks again, because she was worried about capsizing. <laughs> but the, uh, if you look at the medal race, which you've told me we will, uh, the tacks are still too flat, but that's, a, <laughs> that's, just, that's just detail. But the, the point is that that balance is really important to work super, super hard, but to have breaks. And when I say breaks, I don't mean sitting around watching um, lots of movies or whatever. I mean doing something different to be mentally and physically focused. I mean, I think the role models for me at the moment are probably the Kiwi 49er pair. Um, although I do wonder what will happen if the schedules change a bit for 2021 and the America's Cup and uh, the Olympic Games end up very close together or even overlapped. So Pete Burling and Blair Chute, they're your role models. Specifically, why? 
I, I just think they put together a really good program. They're always sailing, but they're doing different things. And, you know, if you came to me, Andy, and let's pretend you're 20 years younger and you said, you know, I want to do an Olympic campaign, um, probably one of the first questions I'd ask you is, do you really want to go sailing every day? Like you can tell the sailors who can't wait to get the cover off the boat and the sailors who will get the cover off the boat and go and do what they need to do. Right. And it's got to be the former. Um, and that's what worried me, the Chinese system. Lily was a standout. The other four girls, I, I did like a little interview with them. Um, why are you sailing? And the most common answer was, I don't want to get married or I don't want to have a job. And I'm like, help. It was reasons to not to do other things. It wasn't reasons to get on the water. Absolutely. So I, I have distinct memories of being in the gym, uh, giving Lily one-to-one -one attention. So we were doing uh, uh, six sets of eight repetitions, going to failure on every set. Um, and uh, the others were sat in the corner playing on their iPhones. But as a coach, I had no problem because I will give my time to the people who, who want it. And I think that's probably why I've ended up doing Olympic sailing, because by the time you get to that point, they really want it. Whereas uh, the junior sailing, I think sometimes it's just a bit of fun, which is a really important part of our sport. But probably uh, an 18 year old girl uh, would do a much better job than me because the sailors would prefer to, <laughs> to see her every single day. And um, it's just about having fun and, and enjoying the love of the sport. For, for me, I've always wanted that people who really want to improve. And I would never want to, to, work, to work with somebody who didn't want to be there. For lack of a better word, I'm, I guess I'm not a very good babysitter. Fair yeah. enough. Lily, I'm wondering one of the reasons may be why, why you like sailing as much as you do. Before you got into sailing, you were very good at swimming, right? Now I was a swimmer uh, since the age of four or five. And uh, at that time, I just uh, swam during the training two hours a day after school. Um, but I won't say I really love or enjoy swimming it's just uh, an exercise to keep me healthy and uh, I have the kind of symptom of couldn't stop you can see Lily in a boat park because she's always casting spells on people <laughs> so, I, I, yeah. I just I just have to say one thing because in the English language it's not always clear when Lee said that she swam every day she swam every day every single day no rest days it was like um we had the conversation about rest days and how important they they were and it was like a language barrier right. so she swam every single day and two rest days a year for during the chinese spring festival only oh wow wow yeah yeah, yeah. like sailing is actually probably slightly better because we have one rest day every week <laughs> so even then what standard were you were you swimming um, I just um, in a district team of Shanghai and then I've competed uh, the Shanghai Children's Championship etc. I haven't been to the national level uh, but it was actually during a training camp to try to be selected by the Shanghai swimming team that I was spotted by the optimist coach of Shanghai sailing team. Right, okay. And when you yeah. made that switch from swimming to sailing, how, um, how long did it take for you to fall in love with sailing? I think the moment I jumped onto the boat, I just feel a lot of fun and then a lot of freedom, and especially for me, um, I feel lots of limitations on land as well as my hearing uh, disability. Uh, when, but once on the boat, I just feel oh, I'm equal to everybody else. And um, I, I, I can't help uh, making comparison with swimming because that's a swimming pool you just swim <laughs> to and back and then I feel quite boring so that's why I feel compared with swimming I much prefer sailing and then it was about two weeks in two weeks time after our training camp I was selected but then it was that evening me my parents and my swimming coaches talked overnight to make this very difficult decision whether to continue my normal life keep studying and then uh, doing swimming exercise or join the sailing team which means i will be away from home 
Right, right. And I'm wondering if once you've been through a sport like swimming, which uh, does seem very monotonous, I mean, I actually enjoy swimming, but I totally know what you mean about <laughs> looking at the bottom of the pool the whole time. Um, once you've experienced that kind of monotony and uh, repetition or repetitiveness, um, I guess there's no excuse to be bored in sailing. Sailing is always <laughs> different, isn't it? Yeah, every day is different. And then the weather, the wind, the, the water. I can't see that a sing, uh, two races are exactly the same, never. So every day we need to use our observer, observation as well as thinking, trying to work out what's the best route as well as uh, we need to have boat handling, work well, have a good speed. So uh, some people quite often ask me, Lily, will you feel lonely on a single-handed <laughs> boat? I said, I'll never feel lonely because my mind is just busy working out lots of uh, things. So, so I really enjoy every second on the water on a sailboat. And the time passed much, much quicker than in a swimming pool. John, coming back to this period of um, making the best of a bad job uh, when Lily had this injury, uh, what, more or less six months before the Olympic Games for London 2012. Um, looking back on it, did, did she arrive at the Games as a better sailor because of that period of injury compared if, with if she hadn't had that injury at all? I, I was just going to go back to... Uh earlier with the rest days because I had an experience that I've never had before in my life. So I actually caught Lily, she's not going to thank me for telling you this, but I caught her on a rest day training. I have never had that with any other sailor. So I go down to the gym to see what weights they have, um, planning the, the next day and she's there on a stationary bike, full of sweat, completely out of breath, must have been 170 beats a minute. And I'm like, this is your rest day. And it's so important that you rest so you don't get ill or injured. And ironically, about three days later, she got the flu and then she, she had to have a week off. Um, so the whole idea of a coach is you, you sort of say things so sailors don't have to, to learn the, the hard way. Um, your actual question, I, I don't want to give you one, one word answer, but, but yes, you know, she was definitely a better sailor for, for having that period of time off. And, and you were going to ask me the, the secret to to winning a gold medal and I said I don't think I can tell you because I want to have coaching work for the next 20 years but I've changed my mind so what you need go. to do here we go I'm going to tell you you have to break this bone okay <laughs> um, because I've got it uh, I've got the hammer ready for Tula uh, I need to get it I need to get it perfectly right because uh, I don't know uh, exactly when the games is going to be but Paul Goodison uh, broke exactly the same bone in his hand before winning uh, in Beijing. Uh, I spent a lot of time holding Lily's hand trying to remove the scar tissue, literally breaking the scar tissue down. Uh, and yeah, I know that uh, Nick Thompson uh, has also broken that bone. Uh, the difference being when Paul Goodison broke his bone, they just put pins in. So think uh, like cocktail sticks, and then they pull them out after six weeks. How, yeah. how did Paul, uh, how did Lily his? had her screws and plates. Sorry? Sorry? How did Paul break his? Was it a cycling accident? Or cycling. <laughs> and Nick Thompson as well. <laughs> I thought yeah. possibly Nick was actually hitting a punch bag, which is an even funnier story. Oh, right. maybe, <laughs> maybe he was copying Goody. I, I, I don't know. I, I did an interview with him and I tried to get some pictures of him to go with the interview. So uh, the pictures were in the gym, but he couldn't do anything. So there's a picture of him on the chest press like this, but if you had scrolled out, you would see there's just a bar, no weights, and he's, <laughs> he's not lifting anything. <laughs> but, but that you, was a long you, time. Sorry, I interrupt you. You were about to say um, Goody had the cocktail stick treatment. Lily, with, with your hand, what, what, was the, what was the repair? How was that made? Uh, they put a pin and screw, six screws, and then... Um, a plate. A plate, a plate. Yeah. yeah. And then... Uh, in a year's time, I had to do another operation to remove it. The difference is, Goody doesn't need to do a second operation. No. You just pull that. Okay. I mean, I, we were literally in Miami, which is world famous for hand surgeries. That's where all the American baseball players go. And I was all ready for uh, Lily to go and have the surgery there. 
And uh, I thought, you know, I better call the team leader just so they know what was going on. And then he turned up and, and, and stopped everything. Um, but as I said, in hindsight, that big break for uh, Lily was, was probably a good thing, but it shouldn't be like that. So we've got a bit of a break now because of uh, COVID-19. So it's important to keep busy. So Tula's going to start doing her thesis now. Um, no good just sitting around. Every, every cloud has a silver lining. It's just really strange having seen how well China behaved, locking everything down, that we didn't start ordering ventilators and, and, and face masks two, two months ago. So yes, I think hindsight is a wonderful thing. Off. Let's not go down that rabbit hole, but but what, <laughs> okay. what, what I am I is, thought you wanted it to be topical. <laughs> I will let that be topical, but we might be here a long time. What what I <laughs> what I'd be more interested in finding out is you, you just mentioned Tula doing her thesis. Um, how is that going to make her a better sailor uh, for for when she does come back to the Olympic Games? Well, I think uh, it's going to remove mental anxiety for her, and I think actually any type of getting better yourself makes a difference i mean i'm always reading books i'm reluctant to say this now after what you said but i have a, a book uh, on immunology which is going to arrive on monday and i'm i'm really interested to read it you know it's important one of the main things for me during the selection uh for tula was just to make sure she didn't didn't get sick um and i think just being busy is is important and then hopefully you know she's going to be completely in love with her boat when they're when they're reunited again I think that's important. I, I was uh, talking to Vittorio Bissaro, the uh, the NACRA 17 sailor who won the Worlds mm. last year. He's shut up in his home and not far from Lake Garda at the moment. And he said that for the first time in many years, he's actually got thinking time, thinking space. Because <laughs> time is always the shortest resource in an Olympic campaign. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Um, so... Lily, John mentioned some of the technical things that, that working on your core work that you did in early 2012 when you weren't able to go sailing. Um, what thinking time and uh, sort of re rethinking of your approach to your campaign did you take yeah. through that time? Mm -hmm. I think actually um, the following key messages I will feel especially useful for people all around the world now since we have probably a few months time <laughs> uh, during this lockdown or shutdown uh, but I, I wouldn't want to deliberately make this happen again but it's like a forced <laughs> yeah don't uh, don't tell Tula forced the rest <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so the, the moment when I fell off the bag the first message in my mind was whether I will be able to do the Olympics because uh, the game's only six months away so if my hand bone did broke then I don't know whether it will recover on time and if it did recover on time will I have enough time to prepare properly because that's the Olympic games and uh, I think what I've learned uh, together with John is uh, not cry over the split milk is that right close <laughs> enough uh -huh. and then so um on one hand probably there's some negative thoughts as well as worrying concerns but immediately i've learned to adjust and then to walk out this darkness i'm thinking wow that's already happened what can i do so the following day well of course china flew me back to operate in shanghai and then the following day after the operation i started to train uh, single leg squat and some core training so my plan was try to improve my fitness so the major part is my core to reduce the stress on my lower back so that I won't have that much lower back pain when I go back to sail again and also to improve my uh, hiking endurance which I was lacking the most at that time so uh, in London campaign unlike probably Chinda. I was really good in lightweight compared with my rivals, but not as quick as uh, Alison Young or Merritt, Baumeister, or not to mention Annalise Murphy. Yeah. <laughs> they are, they're much faster than me in strong weight. So that's my shortest, shortest uh, um, or the weakness in my, as a whole all-round sailor. So I, I plan to use that three months of sailing time to really focus on improving my fitness because in that during that time i can really push myself hard because i don't have any sailing sessions 
uh, whereas normally if we do have sailing sessions probably we need to plan finish training more carefully or mm. not pushing so hard because we want to focus more or be fresher on the water but during that three months i just planned two training sessions pushing really really hard but of course I also plan uh, the rest days well ahead not to overtrain yeah. <laughs> and the second thing I feel benefited the most is, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, after reading some sports psychology book, I really listed just like I was training on the water, one, two, three, four, what I would like to train. So um, the difference is training in my mind instead of actually well, physically on a boat. So the boat handling, how I would like to uh, tag with the big row and then <laughs> how I would like to uh, to sell the upwind with more aggressive body movements so every single detail I try to meditate over and over again and then become so deeply into my subconscious I felt I've never been away from sailing for a single day because I really spend a lot of time. I, I have more time uh, in indoors because I couldn't go out uh, during my recovery for my broken hand. Um, but I use all those um, extra time away from sailing into rehearsal as well as uh, input spend probably a cycle indoor on a stationary bike two to three hours every day i also use that time to meditate instead of i used to watch movie or listen to music i use that to meditate as well because i feel sometimes i need to push really hard on a bike it's just like i was sailing against the married i want to roll her so i, I just combine these two together on one hand i need to push myself cycle really really hard and on the other of those little techniques of sailing is rolling in my mind so that's why unexpectedly three months later in year i'm not sure whether that was world cup or not back then uh it was a uh, mistral week the strongest event or week ever uh, for year event and uh, i walk away with a gold medal which i found it impossible to believe the, the well, funny thing she actually, said to me she said to me do you know who's won <laughs> and i said yes you you've won you you need to go to prize giving now she had no idea but it it wasn't uh at all a secret we really struggled for the 2016 uh olympics and uh about a week before the games i didn't even know whether lily was going to be able to sail due to uh, injuries with her shoulder and we actually tested to see can you make a laser go fast without playing the main sheet i'll give you the secret the answer is no um <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were really lucky that I managed to find the head doctor for the World Cup, which was also in Brazil, um, and he's um, a very uh, famous doctor from uh, Miami, and he gave Lily the corticosteroidal injections, and we had to go through all that process so she could sail. But actually, after uh, the first two days of sailing, uh, maybe she won't tell you this as much as I will, but she was in a lot of pain, and it was just impossible for her to perform at her best. And if we look back at the 2012 campaign, she did have a small amount of shoulder issues uh, every so often. Um, and actually having that break then meant that uh, her shoulders were okay for the games. And then after the games, Lily was back in China for 2013 and I didn't coach her. Uh, she was just there really with the Chinese. And the next time I saw her, her, uh, her shoulders were the way they are now. And, you know, she's had two operations and lots of problems because of this. So, yeah, that break, it's so important. It's not only the mental thing that Lily's talked about so well, but physically. And I don't know a better way to put it other than nobody thinks about being injured until you're injured. Like, we don't drive our car around until we run out of fuel. Like, you keep it topped up, don't you? And people should be looking at protecting their body that way. So yeah. the question, yeah, we, sorry, go on, Billy. Uh, I, I will feel your audience can take away these very useful uh, lessons from my past experience. So for example, now we may well have two or three months uh, staying at home, but that will be a golden time, not only to freshen our minds. Uh, mm. I believe it's possible to improve us as a sailor, both physically and mentally, as well as techniques. 
I truly believe the power of psychology or mental toughness. If you do meditation every day, even though you, we can't sell now for two, three months, when we go back to sell, if we did train or practice in our mind, we can still sell very fluently, just like we've never been away. So really make the most of a single day during this COVID-19 situation. And if you want to know what the main job of an Olympic coach is, that's what it is. It's not the, it's not the technical stuff. <laughs> it's re removing the barriers that stop your sailor performing. At yes. the very top level. And, yeah, and you yeah. mentioned earlier, super fit. You mentioned earlier that the secret to winning a gold medal, John, it, it is not so much the winning it, it's, it's the not losing it. And it does seem that whereas we see a lot of personal bests achieved on the athletics track, and people rise to the occasion at the Olympic Games, setting new records for the 100 metres. It does seem that in sailing, um, a lot of really good sailors don't rise to the occasion. We don't see them put in their best performance at the Olympic Games. But there are other people, maybe that you didn't expect so much, um, that really rise to the occasion. I, I think of someone like Vasily Svogar, for example, mm -hmm. winning a bronze medal in the in the laser and... And, and then a silver in the laser, and then another uh, silver. Goody in did the help. <laughs> Goody did help. Oh well, he probably did. Yes, you're right. <laughs> old Rasmus Mogren in Beijing 2008. Yes, yeah. um, that that is true. But um, uh, it, it does seem like in sailing. Do you agree with that with that premise? Because it's you're you're absolutely right. Uh, statistically, my understanding is sailing has the worst conversion of world champions. To Olympic medalists in the Olympic year of, of any sport. Um, the thing is it's very dynamic so actually it's quite easy for sailors to hit the physical peak at the target week and actually I would say 95% of them do. Um, my job is always prevention, you know, avoid injury, um, avoid uh, illness. So um, with the, the COVID-19 one of my main concerns for the world was just you know not, not for the sailor to be ill just to isolate and keep safe. Um, but the mental aspect of sailing is so important that it, it is hard, it's just hard to be consistent. So if you're, and I'm really exaggerating here, but if you're a 400 meter runner and you run 400 meters in 30 seconds, you know you're gonna win the gold medal. You, you just know it. You know, you could not hear the starting signal and you're still gonna win. But with sailing, you can be the fastest person on the course and, and make some mistakes. And the other thing is, it's very hard to prepare. So we will spend a lot of time in the Olympic venue. And I was very lucky, obviously, with Weymouth that I'd already spent a lot of time there. So I know the venue very well before working with, with Lily. But we spent a lot of time measuring the currents, looking at the likely wins for a 2020 Olympic Games. And suddenly, it's not. I mean, the Olympic Games might not even be in the summer. So it's, it's really hard to be completely prepared Whereas if you're always running a set distance on a track, then, then it is easier to get that, um, that exact peak. And, and also, as I said, pressure does funny things to people. And that's the main job of an Olympic coach is helping your sailors deal with that pressure. And one of the ways you do that is just to do everything so many times, it feels like normal. So we will run a lot of coaching regattas and a lot of races at the Olympic venue. So actually to, to race in Weymouth, in 18 knots in a southwesterly on this on the Nove course seems really uh, it's just you know it's what I do every day. I did a lot of match racing with Lily on the medal race course, chasing her around and around and around and around. And actually, she didn't need to do that. It came down to four people. But if she had had to have a max race uh, mentally, she would have been uh, really comfortable with that because we have practiced it so much. We're always comfortable with things we do a lot like uh, the, the normal drive you do, you're perfectly, perfectly happy. When you go to a foreign country, the steering wheel's on the other side, you're, set, you're in a different car, and you're driving somewhere you've never been before, you're, you're much less comfortable, or well, at least I am. The, the big problem with the Olympics uh, is that uh, it's very hard to replicate all the strange, unique things about the mm. Olympic Games. Suddenly, all those microphones and cameras <laughs> in your face. Um, I did that with Lily as well. I started trying to get her to do interviews and things well before the games. And actually with the uh, sort of the mic and the camera, 
uh, you won't see, but for a lot of the early interviews, I stood just in front of Lily near the cameraman so she could just pretend she's talking to me. And then again, it's normal. I'm just asking you about your race. And um, well, you obviously did a phenomenal job with preparing for such a unique event as the Olympic Games. And I, I come back to the, uh, to the trick of playing the actress. And I just wonder, when you were playing yourself as an actress, this, this elegant actress, were you looking out of your own eyes or what, were you watching Lily the actress in a movie? Were you watching yourself on a movie screen? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, no, I won't watch myself. And I just think I need to focus on what I'm doing and I want to do the best job I can. And those things I have control over, I want to do it really well. And at the same time, I accept all these uh, other influences or the environment, suddenly a lot of uh, cameras surrounding you. Um, I just say to myself, those I, I have no control over and don't need to worry about. And then just uh, thinking, I, I'm used to this, no problem. And talking about control, only controlling the things that you have control over, um, that's something as sailors we have to learn. That surely is a great lesson for all of us as we go through this pandemic. Uh, it's a lesson for life, <laughs> every aspect of your life. If you can't control something, why, why bother thinking about it? Life's it's so short. easy to say, it. it's quite difficult to do for a lot of people. You have to practice what you, what you preach. It's like any skill, the more you practice it, the, you know, the, the easier it becomes. The only thing is you do need to look backwards and learn from past mistakes. That, that's two two separate things but yeah you, you need to focus your energies on where you can make positive changes in your life that simple john and lily there's much more i want to ask you but i'm going to come back to you in another video where we're going to dig in to the detail of what happened in that medal race and i, I want to put heart rate monitors on both of you as well while we're watching it and see who's heart oh. Is I already told you I hate watching this because somehow <laughs> I worry there's going to be an alternative ending uh, which was different to the original and if, every time I'm I'm coaching particularly you sailors I guess and it's blowing 30 knots I, I know I'm going to be watching this video just one more time uh, but okay thanks well, Andy. I'm going to drag you through it just one more time but not for the last time in your life but anyway for, for this for the end of this call thank you very much some fantastic insights that you pro provided there uh, to, to how between the two of you you've you've managed to be so successful so thanks for joining me